This evening, like I said earlier on, we're going to be continuing our study of the Gospel of Mark. And tonight, we're going to be studying from verse 35 all the way to verse number 41 of Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, reading from verse number 35 all the way to verse number 41. So if you have your Bibles, let's open to the book of Mark chapter 4. I will start reading from verse number 35. The Bible tells us this, say, On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. And when they had left the multitude, they took him along in a boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great wind stopped, arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already feeling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be? That even the wind and the sea obey him. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his words in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we go into our study proper tonight, I want to give you a quick overview of what we have seen in the passage of scripture that we just read. From the passage of scripture we read, we see the command of our Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples to cross over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Reading from verse number 35 of Mark chapter 4, the Bible tells us they say, On the same day, when the evening had come, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. In other words, let's cross from where we are to where we need to go. And now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in a boat as he was, and other, other little boats were also with him. In other words, Lord Jesus Christ gave his command, gave his disciples a very simple command. I need you to move from where you are. I need to move to the other side of the lake. And then the other side of the sea. And the question is, why is the Lord Jesus Christ telling them to move? The reason is very simple. Jesus has been involved in ministry all day. He had been teaching and healing the people, and the people kept on coming. They kept asking for more. And at the even count, Jesus Christ now said, Okay, it is time for us to be able to take a break, to take a break. So after the day-long ministry, Jesus asked his disciples, as long as we remain here, the people will keep coming and there will be no need, there will be no time for relaxing. So there's a need for us to be able to take a break. And so they had to cross over to the other side of the lake. The second thing I want you to see in the scripture that we read is the rising of the storm as they were attempting to cross the lake. As they were attempting to cross the lake, you find that, that the storm arose. Bible tells us in verse number 37, say, and a great wind storm arose and the waves beat into the, into the boat so that it was already filled. Here we see that even though Jesus Christ was the one that gave the disciples instruction, he was the one who told them to go from where they are to the other side. He was the one who commanded them. And although Jesus told them to cross over to the other side, the Bible makes us to understand that that while they were following the instruction of the Lord, a storm arose. So it, it, what it simply tells us that even when we are following the instruction of the Almighty God, storms can still arise in our lives. Although they were following the instruction that Lord Jesus Christ gave them, you will notice that they were still exposed to the dangers that came as a result of the rough seas. And so that tells us, the fact that you hear a clear instruction from God as to what to do, does not mean that you are not going to face challenges in life. That's basically what the Bible is like, making us to understand. The fact that you heard instruction from the Lord, the fact that you are following, you are obeying His commandment, the fact that you are doing exactly what the Lord asks you to do, does not mean that the storms of life will not arise. The storms of life will arise even when we are doing the perfect will of the Almighty God. Jesus gave them the instruction to cross over to the other side. The disciples followed the instruction in total obedience, yet the storm of life arose. It tells a lot. The fact that somebody is going through a difficult time in life does not mean that they are out there, they are out of the will of God. They might be right in the center of the will of God and the enemy might try to be able to stop them. The third thing I want you to see from the passage of scripture that we've read is that while the storm was raging, the disciples were fighting, you know, they were fighting what? They were fighting for their own lives. 
we see the humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ in that passage of scripture. That Jesus Christ was both fully God and fully man. And the manifestation of his humanity was on display during that particular situation. Look at verse number 38. In verse number 38, the Bible says, But I see, but he was in the stir, that is, as the wind was blowing and the disciples were trying to steady the sheep, the Bible says that he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they are walking and said, Teacher, do you not care that we perish? In the, this is, as indicated earlier on, our Lord Jesus Christ had gone through a long day of ministry, ministering to people, attending to their need. He was exhausted from preaching and ministry. The Bible makes us, the Bible tells us that as they entered into the boat, he went, I don't know, he went to sleep on a pillow. While the disciples were trying to get them from point A to point B, he decided to go take a rest. So while the disciples were busy rowing against the tide, the Bible tells us that Jesus was asleep on a pillow. In other words, he was sound asleep even when there was the rough seas. He was sound asleep. Even when the, even when the sea was boisterous and they find out that the, the waters were beating against the boat, Jesus was asleep. He was so sound asleep that he did not even see. He did not feel. He was not disturbed by what was going on. And the Bible makes us to understand that his disciples had to go and wake him up. They had to tell Jesus that, this, that, that the, the situation was a, was a little bit dicey and they had to wake him up. That tells us that Jesus had the capacity also to be exhausted. The fact that we are doing the service of the Almighty God does not mean that we are no longer human. The fact that we are doing the service of the Almighty God doesn't mean that we are not going to be tired. It doesn't mean that we are not going to need rest. This particular situation tells us Jesus needed to rest and he was asleep even when in the midst of the storm. He had to sleep. He had to be able to rest from after a hard day of ministry. So that tells us that Jesus Christ, if Jesus needed rest, you and I also need rest. The fourth thing I want you to see from the passage of scripture that we see is the disciples' accusation of our Lord Jesus Christ of his insensitivity. There's an accusation of insensitivity of our Lord Jesus Christ by his disciples. Look at that verse number 38 again. The Bible tells us that Jesus, when the disciples tried to be able to steady the ship, they tried to no avail to be able to steady the boat, and the Bible tells us that they were forced to call the attention of our Lord Jesus Christ. They had to go and wake him up. And when they were waking him up, they had to, you know, they, they, they were a little bit, uh, they were a little bit kind of, kind of aggressive against him in the sense that the way they waked him up, they were basically accusing him of his sensitivity. Look at that verse number 38 again. Mark chapter 4, verse number 38, the Bible tells us that he said, and he, but he said, but he was in the stern, asleep on the pillow. And they woke him up. Now look at what they said to him when they woke him up. Teacher, do you not care that we perish? In other words, the disciples, when they finally woke the Lord Jesus Christ, were basically saying to him, how can you sleep in this kind of situation? The wind is boisterous. The sea, the, the ship is being tossed up and down. It appears as if you are going to capsize and you are sleeping. How can you sleep in this kind of situation? Do you not care about us? Do you not care that we might die? Do you not care that we might perish? Don't you, does it matter to you what life is going to do? Don't you care that the people that you are investing your life in are going to die on the sea? That was basically what they were saying to him. He said, Master, the teacher, do you not care that we perish after they woke him up? In other words, they were basically accusing Jesus Christ of his sensitivity to their plight. They were basically saying that, that you do not care about the situation that we find ourselves. We are all, we all know that their outburst was due to fear, but they were accusing Jesus of not being caring, of insensitivity, of not caring about what's going on around the people that he brought to the boat. And then the final thing I want you to see in that passage of scripture is the Lord's display of authority over the force of nature. The authority of the Lord Jesus Christ over the force of nature. Look at verse number 39. In verse number 39, the Bible tells us that, that Jesus did not initially respond to the accusation of his disciples. When they woke him up, he did not tell them, he did not rebuke them immediately. He first of all dealt with the situation and then came back to them. If you look at the first thing he said, the Bible tells us that verse number 39. The Bible says, and then he arose. Instead of talking to those people who are accusing him of his sensitivity, the Bible says he arose. Verse number 39, he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. 
In other words, Jesus, after raising up, you know, after being woken up from the sleep, he spoke to the raging sea. He asked, as he told, he spoke to that particular power behind that sea and asked the sea to calm down. And the sea obeyed the voice of the Creator. After Jesus dealt with the sea and calmed the sea, then he turned to his disciples. And then, and that's what you see in the, 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 the 16 that I want to show you from the passage of Scripture is the rebuke of the disciples. The rebuke of the disciples. Look at verse number 40. After Jesus has dealt with the sea, has spoken to the sea, and the sea has obeyed, and the sea has calmed down, Jesus now turned to the disciples in verse number 40. He said, why are you so fearful? Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? In other words, I'm in the boat with you. Although I'm asleep, it doesn't mean that the, you know, it doesn't mean that the situation will, 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 the situation you are facing will overtake you. How many of you know that even a lion in his sleep is still a lion? Right? It doesn't matter. Whether the lion is asleep or awake, he's still a lion. You see, don't mess up with it, you know. And that's what Jesus was trying to make them to understand. He said, Why are you so afraid? Why don't you have faith? In other words, Jesus was a little surprised and disappointed at the condition, at the, at the fearful condition, or at the faithless condition that the, 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 the disciples exhibited. It was like he was saying, really guys, I am here. And you are crying as if you are going to die? You guys really don't think that I have the power to be able, you are going to perish in the storm while I'm in the boat? Is that what you think? Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? That was the question. That was the rebuke of our Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, we see the fearful amazement of the disciples. The Bible tells us in verse number 41, after Jesus has rebuked them, in verse number 41, the disciples now say, they said they were free. They feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be? Even that even the wind and the sea obey his voice. In other words, the disciples were wondering, here was a guy who is sleeping in the middle of a storm, in the middle of a, of a boisterous sea. He was asleep. And when he woke up, he spoke to the wind. He spoke to the storm. And the storm had to cool down. And they were all relaxed. And there was peace. And they began to wonder. Yes, we know this guy can heal the sick. Yes, we know he can do miracles. No, we, yes, we know he has been able to. But speaking to elements, speaking to the sea, Telling the sea to relax and to cool down. He said, that's a different level. That's a different level of, no, that's a different level of authority over life and over nature. And because of that, the Bible said they were afraid. And they began to ask themselves the question, who is this guy that even the sea, even the wind, obey him? Not just life, not just sickness, not just demon. Even inanimate objects hear the voice of the creator and they obey. And that made them very, very uncomfortable. And so that is a high level overview of the passage of scripture that we've read. And so this evening we want to focus on just a couple of about three or four verses in that passage of scripture, then we'll be able to extract what the Lord Jesus is saying. And so if you have your Bible still with you, I want you to still open back to that Mark chapter 4 and we'll be reading from verse number 37. In verse number 37 the Bible says and a great windstorm arose and the wind beat into the boat so that it was already filled but, it were, but he was in the stern, asleep on the pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? Is it that you, is it that you have no faith? In other words, as earlier indicated when I was going through the analysis of what we've seen so far, you see our Lord Jesus Christ and his disciples were crossing the sea. Okay? And when they got to the boat, the Bible tells us Jesus went to sleep. And when we're told that Jesus went to sleep, as Jesus was asleep, a storm arose. His disciples tried to roll through the storm, but they could not. In fear and in pain, and their thought of impending disaster, they decided to invite Jesus into the situation by waking him up. When they woke him up, they accused him of not caring. When Jesus spoke, he rebuked the storm, and the storm cooled down, and then he turned to his disciples in verse number 40, he said, why are you so fearful? In other words, Jesus was saying to his disciples, after he calmed them still, after he calmed the sea, he was asking them, what is the big deal? Why are you losing your mind because of a storm? Why? Is Jesus, Jesus was asking his disciples, and you know, Jesus, he was, yeah, it's like Jesus was saying to his disciples, I am surprised that you are afraid. In a situation like this, I am in the boat, 
Things are going the way they are going, but you should never be afraid because I am with you. That's basically what Jesus was saying to them. Now, before we go on, let me ask you the question. How many of us have ever taken a flight and you have been involved in a serious turbulence? You know, when the plane is shaking like this, it's crazy. Just shaking any house if it's going to fall off the sky. If you've ever gone through a serious turbulence, that is when you begin to say your last prayer. Because you know that thing can be really, really scary. Okay? Now, imagine after you have experienced a turbulence. Okay? And by the time the plane finally lands, somebody calls you and says, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you are faithless? <laughs> you look at that face and say, Really? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Were you not in the same plane that I just came out from? That's exactly what this is what just happened. You see a sheep. I remember there's a friend of mine who told me about it when he went on a cruise. It was in South America, you know, when they were crossing, you know, at the very bottom of South America in Brazil. He said, for some reason, they got caught in the storm. And the storm lasted for a couple of days. He said, for about three or four days, they were in that storm. And he said, that was the worst days of his life because the ship was just, it was like the whole thing was going to capsize. He said, now, imagine that kind of a guy coming out of that ship and you meet Jesus and Jesus says, why are you so fearful? I didn't, I don't you have faith? The man will say, are you kidding me? <laughs> Is it not the same boat that we are in right now? But that's exactly what happened to them. You know, that's exactly what happened. Those people will say, they, 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 they are in a terrible storm and you are asking why they are fearful. And the question is, why would Jesus say something like that? Why would he say something like that? Why would you be telling somebody who has just experienced a storm and he knows, and these are not just ordinary guys, these are serious fishermen. If a fisherman can be afraid of a storm, you know it's a serious storm. And Jesus is saying, why are you afraid? So why is he asking them that question? Why is he asking them that question? Let me suggest something things to you. Jesus rebuked the disciples for their being fearful and lacking faith because Jesus was basically telling his disciples that as a disciple of Christ, faith and fear are incompatible. Wherever you become afraid, whenever you become to exercise fear, definitely your faith is no longer in operation at that point. That's what Jesus was saying. As long as you begin to show that you are afraid of a situation, you will not be able to put your trust in the one who is able to deliver. That's what he's saying. And the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7, say, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of a sound mind. In other words, in any serious, difficult situation, if we begin to show the sign of fear, we are basically telling the whole world that faith is not in operation at that point in time. So Jesus rebuked them because he's saying, faith and fear, they are not compatible. They cannot exist in the same boat. It's either you believe in God or you don't. It's not, it's not, it's, they're not, they're not, they're not, they're not, they're not, they're not compatible. Number two, Jesus, you know, Jesus rebuked his disciple for being fearful and lacking faith because Jesus was saying, where there is, you know, where there is faith, where there is fear, faith cannot flourish. In other words, they are not just, it's not that they are just not incompatible, they are not just compatible. The problem is that when there is fear in the heart of a man, Faith will never be able to operate. Faith will never be able to function. Faith will never be able to grow. That's what Jesus is saying. And if your faith cannot grow, you will never be able to please God. That's what the Bible tells us in Hebrews 11. Say, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that will come to him must believe that he is. And he's the reward of those who prepare to seek him. So in other words, Jesus is saying, number one, a disciple of Jesus Christ, in the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ, Faith and fear, they are not compatible. They can never agree together. Number two, when there is faith, when there is fear in the heart of a disciple, of a child of God, he will never be able to nourish faith. Faith cannot grow. Faith cannot be established. Faith cannot be, able, cannot be put into operation. That's what Jesus was telling them. And the Bible says that fear brings a snare. Whosoever put a distrust in the Lord, only that person is saved. That's the Bible, that's the Bible telling us in the book of uh, uh, Psalm 29 verse 25. So number three, when Jesus rebuked his disciple for being fearful and lacking faith, Jesus was saying, peace of mind. When you exhibit peace of mind in the midst of the storm, it is an evidence of your faith in the Almighty God. In other words, when you are going through your own challenges, when you are all going through your own storms in life, when things are upside down, and there is peace like a river that overflows in your heart is simply an evidence that yet you believe in your Lord and the Lord, in the 
God and yourself. So Jesus is saying, peace of mind is the evidence of our faith in the Almighty God. Isaiah 26 verse 3 tells us that thou wilt keep in perfect peace whose heart is stayed on thee because he trusts in you. Okay? When the heart of an individual is trusting the Almighty God, when that person has confidence in the ability and the power of the Almighty God to be able to deliver, there is peace at the back of your mind. It's just like when you open your bank account and you see enough money and somebody comes and is making noise and you know you have not enough money to pay that person. You are not disturbed. You don't bother with that person. You just ask it, how much is it? And you put your hand on you give him a card or you, pay, you do whatever because you know that you can do it. Peace is the evidence, peace of mind is the evidence of our faith and our trust in the Almighty God. So when Jesus rebuked his disciples, when he was telling them, when he was rebuking them for being fearful and for lacking faith, he was telling them, your fear is, is the evidence that uh, you don't believe in the Almighty God. The fact that you are afraid and you are so fearful is an evidence that you don't have confidence in the ability of the Almighty God or my ability to be able to take care of you. The fact that you are afraid is the evidence of your absence in your trust. Your, in the, is the evidence of a, of a lack of trust in the Almighty God. The lack of trust in the faithfulness of the Almighty God. And why is that the case? Why is that the case? Why is fear an evidence of lack of faith? The reason is because our fear, no, the reason is because our fear tells the whole world that we are not sure about the promise of the Almighty God. That's what they're saying. Because if somebody comes and he tells you, I'm going to give you X, Y, Z, and you are still afraid, and you are still worried, and you are still anxious, it means that you don't trust the person who has made a promise to you. That's basically what you're saying. And that's what Jesus, that's why Jesus is rebuking them. I am in the boat. I am with you. And you are afraid that you are going to die. You are simply telling me that you are not certain about the promises that I'm going to, that are made towards you. That's what Jesus was telling them. Jesus was basically telling them the reason that they are fear. The reason that their fear is an evidence that their fear is an evidence of lack of faith is because our fear tells the whole world that we are not persuaded by the things that we put our trust in. We are not persuaded by the things that we put our trust in. I've said this thing over and over for those who are close to me. I said that if you don't trust the chair that you are sitting on, you will not sit on it. If you don't trust a man that that man who has your best interest at heart, you will never open up to that person. And if you don't trust the almighty God to be able to meet you at the point of your need, you will not pray. And so Jesus is saying, when we exhibit fear, we are telling the whole world that we are not persuaded by our faith in the almighty God. When we fear, we are telling the whole world that we do not have confidence in the ability of the almighty God to meet us at the point of our needs. So that's what Jesus was, that's why he was speaking to me. You have been with me for a while now. You see all the things that I've done. You see the anointing of the Almighty God. You see the glory of the Almighty God revealed upon me. And we are in the same boat. And you are afraid that you are going to die. That means you don't trust me. That means you won't believe everything that I've been telling you. That means you have no confidence in my ability. You have no confidence in my person. You have no confidence in my purpose and the plan that I come to execute on earth. And because we are uncertain, because we are not convinced, and because we're not confident, we become, we begin to, we begin to show, we begin to manifest fear. We begin to worry. We begin to be anxious because we do not have that confidence in the Almighty God. But where there is confidence, where there is assurance, where we are fully persuaded, you'll find that the fear, worry, and anxiety disappears. And so Jesus is saying to his disciples that your fear and your anxiety is because you do not believe me. Because if you believe me, fear and anxiety will have no place in you. Because it will bring confidence into your heart. It is because you are not fully persuaded. You are not convinced that the things that I'm saying to you, that they are true. That's why you are afraid. Jesus is saying, it's because you are not fully convinced of my ability to keep me, my authority over life and death. That is why you are anxious. That is why you are afraid. That is why you are worried. That's why you think you are going to die in the sea. But I told you that I'm not going to, I have come here to be able to accomplish a work. Do you think the enemy will be able to kill me in a, on the, on the, on the, uh, in a, in a ride between point A and point B? 
If you don't be, if if you believe that the enemy, enemy can do that, means you don't need to believe in your family. That's what Jesus was telling you. And now, without expressly saying it, Jesus was telling his disciples, if you trusted me, you will not be afraid in the middle of the storm. Because you know I'm there. If you trusted me, if you are convinced of who I am, then you will not be anxious. Because you know I'm going to meet your need. I'm going to take care of you. I will never allow evil to come near you. Jesus was basically telling them, if you are persuaded about my authority over life and over everything that is created, then you will be at peace. Yeah, but because you are not convinced, because you are not settled, because you are not fully persuaded, that is why you have all this issue of fear worry and anxiety. Jesus is saying the fact that you are not at peace tells me that you really don't have faith in everything that I'm doing. So where there is fear, where there is worry, where there is an anxiety is an indication that your faith is not fully settled. Where the heart is not at peace is an indication that there is still area that needs to, there is still work to be done in the area of our faith. And when you notice the disciples could not argue with the Lord Jesus Christ. You notice that? They didn't argue. When Jesus told them, why are you so fearful? They could not argue that they were not afraid. They could not argue that they were fearful. The disciples could not challenge the conclusion that the Lord Jesus Christ made concerning them and the way they felt, their anxiety, their fear, and their worries. They couldn't couldn't challenge it. And the question is, how then do you as an individual, how then do I as an individual build a faith that is able to stand in the middle of a storm? How do you do it? Because those things don't just come because you are, you know, because you are standing right next to Lord Jesus Christ. These guys stand to stood next to Jesus Christ, but they could not develop that kind of faith. So how do we develop a faith that is able to carry us through a period of you, through a season of storm? When things are upside down, when there's nobody to call to, when life appears to be at the, in danger, how do you develop a, a, a faith that is at peace, a heart that is at peace with the Almighty God? Let's look at Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. We start reading from verse number 19. Romans chapter 4, reading from verse number 19. The Bible says, And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised was able also to perform. The question is, how do you develop a faith that is able to bring you peace of mind in the middle of your storm? Some of my storm might be just my last for about an hour, some might last for a week, some might last for a year, and in the case of Abraham, his storm lasted for almost 25 years. How do you keep your faith strong and have your peace of mind when you are doing this? Number one, number one, we develop a faith that brings peace in troubled times when we keep, when we do not focus on the obvious. When we do not focus on the obvious. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, reading from verse number 8, it says, why we do not look at the things which are seen but are the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are what? They are eternal. In other words, the storms of life are temporal. Okay? The challenges of life are temporal. They will not last forever. Understanding this fact will build our faith and give us peace in the time of our storm. In Romans chapter 4 verse 19, the Bible says, Do be not weak in faith. He did not consider his own body to be dead. In other words, he wasn't looking at the present. He wasn't looking at the obvious thing that he said. The disciples were looking around them. They only saw the storm that was going on, but they could not see beyond the storm because they were focused on the obvious. The only way we can keep our heart strong, the only way we can give our heart peace in the middle of our storm is to come to that realization that our peace, that our storm is only for the moment. The storm is only for the moment. It will not last forever. That's why Paul the Apostle writing to the, to the Corinthian church in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 8 that I read a bit ago. Say, why would you not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen? For the things which are seen, the things that are around you right now, the sickness, the disease, the, the lack, the want, the of you. He said, all those things are temporal. But the things beyond those things are the eternal world. 
And so if you want to have your, your mind at rest, in the middle of your storm, you are to not to focus on the obvious things that are in front of you. You look at the things that are beyond. Number two, how do we build? And, you know, how do we develop the faith that gives us peace in the middle of our storm? We develop faith that brings peace in the midst of our storm when we do not waver at the promise of the Almighty God. When you do not waver at the promise of the Almighty God. When we walk steadily with the Almighty God. The Bible tells us in James chapter 1. If you read from verse number 5, he says, If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who is able, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. And it will be given to him. He said, But let him ask in faith, not doubting. For he who doubts is like the wave of the sea, driven, to driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything. He is double-minded, unstable in his way. So if we are going to survive in the middle of our storm, if we are going to have peace of mind in the middle of our storm, we are supposed to hold on to the promise of the Almighty God. The Bible says God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent. Whatever he said he will do, he will do it. When we hold on to that promise, it gives us peace of mind. The Bible makes us, he it it makes all things beautiful in his own time. When we hold on to that promise, we know that whatever comes to us will be beautiful in its own time. When we hold on to the word of the Almighty God, who the Sammy say? He said, I've been young and I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a sick begging bread. When you hold on to that word of God, it gives you peace of mind. And so for us to be able to develop our peace and enjoy peace in the middle of our storm, number one, take your eyes away from the obvious thing that is around you. Focus on that which is beyond. And that is what gives you peace. Number two, we do not waver. You do not take away, get away from the promise of the Almighty God, but you hold on to the promise of the Almighty God. Number three, we develop faith that brings peace in times of storm when we keep believing and giving God the glory. Look at, look at Romans chapter 4 verse number 20. Talking about Abraham. The Bible says he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. But, look at the next statement. He said, was strengthened in faith, giving glory to the Almighty God. You keep believing the Almighty God. In other words, it is not enough to be able to remain steadfast. We need to keep rejoicing in the presence of the Almighty God. We need to be praising the Almighty God. Because that is when the heavens open. That is when the Lord Almighty begins to give us insight as to how to be able to navigate our difficult situation. It is when you keep praising the Almighty God that His presence come down. We know the story of the three Hebrew children. The Bible makes us to understand in the middle of their storm, they were singing praise to the Almighty God. And the presence of the Almighty God came down. Whereby that which was meant to consume them became a place where they were rejoicing in the presence of the Almighty God. The same thing happened to Daniel. The things, the beasts that were meant to be able to eat him up were the same beasts that they passed the night with and they were not able to touch him. The reason is because they were not only steadfast in their faith, they were rejoicing in the presence of the Almighty God. And as soon as you rejoice in the presence of the Almighty God, the Bible says the Lord inhabits the praise of his people. And when God comes down, no devil can touch you. So please understand, peace of mind. In the middle of our storm, number one is for you to take your eyes away from what everyone, what the devil is trying to show you and focus on what God is showing you. Number two, you have to keep your faith steadfast. You don't be, that is not the time for you to begin to doubt and begin to question the Almighty God. Number three is to begin to keep on believing and giving glory to the Almighty God. And then finally is to be fully convinced through His Word. Truly convinced through His Word. Look at verse number 21 of Romans chapter 4. The Bible says, being fully persuaded. That means he is convinced. He is sure that God will never disappoint his word. He said, being fully persuaded that what he has promised, he is able to do. Until you are convinced that God is able to do what he has promised to do, when the storm comes, there's a strong probability that we are going to let go. Unless we are fully persuaded that God is a faithful God, that he will never lie. He said, as a scribe was on the palm of his hand, unless we are fully persuaded and fully convinced, you will find out that when the storms of life begin to come, we may not be able to stand. In other words, we trust in the word of the word of the word of the Almighty God, regardless of what the enemy is showing us. We trust in the word of the Almighty God, regardless of what is happening around us. When we are able to do so, that is when we will begin to find peace in the middle of our storm. Please understand that these things don't just happen. Being able to take your eyes away from the obvious. Being able to focus on the Almighty God and trust in Him and not to waver. 
being able to continue to rejoice in the middle of that storm, being able to be convinced of his word. Those things don't just happen overnight. It takes time. It takes discipline of the word of God. Studying the word of God. It takes a consistent engagement of the practice of the word of God. You have to be able to put the word of God to practice. Uh, it takes uh, an unrelenting prayer to birth the divine the enablement that enables you to be able to stand in the middle of your storm. It takes a conscious praise uh, and worship of the almighty God. That's what it takes. It takes time. It takes discipline study of the word of God. It takes consistent engagement and practice of the word of God that you have studied. It takes an unrelenting prayer to birth a divine enablement in your system. And it takes a conscious praise, a determination to worship the almighty God. That's what, that's what uh, Job was saying. He said, even though he slays me, I will yet worship. I will yet praise. It's a determination that regardless of what the enemy throws at me, I have made my call. I have made my stand. I will remain with the Lord. That was what the Lord Jesus Christ was trying to teach his disciples. That your fear and your unbelief, your, your fear is a result, is, a, is an indication that you are not fully trusted God, that you are not fully persuaded. That was what the Lord was trying to teach them. And so as we close, please know that the storms will arise. Even in the midst of our obedience, storm will arise. Jesus told them to move from one point of the lake to the other. And while they were obeying the Lord, a storm came. So the storm will always arise. But the man and the woman who will be able to sleep and be at peace in the middle of that storm is the one who has unfailing confidence in the Lord Almighty, who is fully persuaded by his word and who is totally assured that the Lord Almighty will watch over him. The question is, are we such people, even in this time and age, are we such people, the kind of people who trust in the Almighty God, the kind of people who believe in this world, the kind of people who are not swayed by the situation that is around us? Let's bow our heads as we talk to the Almighty God.